All right, moving right along. Uh, we're going to talk about motion right now. Our next guest has written this book, as well as several other books, as well as authored a lot of DVDs, as well as, as is on the uh, Ripple Training DVDs, uh, and is also, if you catch him on Mac Break, which is with Alex Lindsay, you can see him talking about the new features in Motion 4. He is considered one of the experts in motion in the world, and we are very, very welcome to have him and very honored to have him. Please welcome from the Bay Area, Mark Spencer. Thanks, Michael. You guys hear me okay? All right. I once played with motion in Nantucket. If you want to know the rest, we'll have a beer after. Okay. <laughs> so who's, who's working with Motion 3 right now? Who's doing stuff with it? And how many on Motion 4? How many have already started playing around with Motion 4? Just a couple of folks here. Okay. So the coolest, sexiest new stuff about Motion 4, in my opinion, is the stuff that when we saw Motion 3, we said, where is this stuff? Right? Because Motion 3 came out, came out with this great 3D. It's fantastic, you know, Motion got 3D, it worked really well, but it didn't have two things that immediately everybody said, wait, anybody know what those are? Shadows, right. No shadows in Motion 3. We have shadows in Motion 4. What's the other one? Yeah, depth of field or, or lack thereof, right? Be able to have a short depth of field so you can throw things out of focus. That wasn't in Motion 3, and we've had it in Motion 4. Um, I'm just showing you a couple little movies uh, some are from an upcoming training because I'm probably going to not get to talk too much about those features because I want to talk about a couple other things. But just so that you see that it does that and it looks cool, there's some neat stuff you can do really quickly with reflections, I'm sorry, with shadows and depth of field. And the third one that Apple threw in there that was kind of a surprise was reflections. To be able to take any surface and actually make it reflective so you don't have to go through the rigmarole of faking reflections by duplicating and inverting layers and masking them. And doing all this. So, neat things, shadows, depth of field, and reflections. However, um, what I want to talk about a little bit today are some things that are not as obvious, but I think they're tremendously helpful full workflow um, items. And I'm going to focus on the 3D ones. If I have enough time, I'll talk about another behavior that slipped in there that seems very small, that's pretty big. But I mostly want to talk about uh, working in 3D and getting around in 3D. And specifically, um, I have a little scene set up, and this is, this is actually a project from the book. And by the way, just, this is sort of at the back of the book. One of the things we did when we reorganized the book is, is 3D came kind of early in the book last time, and people kind of went sideways. You know, you're first getting to learn motion, and then you're jumping right into the deep end of the pool. So we kind of push that until you're a little more familiar with everything. So this is toward the back of the book. But what I want to do is look at uh, what this, how this scene is set up. So. Um, uh, I'll open the layers tab just so we can kind of see there's these three groups in here. I'm going to make it that's as small as I can get on this resolution. Okay. So nothing new here. I'm just going to go to the top view. And uh, there I can see my scene as if I flew up in the air. And I have, if I select each of these groups, each of these groups consists of, I'll pop one open, um, a, a video image. And these two images are actually text that are saved as an image. Uh, because it's a custom font that you might not have installed in your system. So I say there's an image. But if I look in the top view, if I select the camera, I can kind of see how everything's laid out. Uh, if I go to a right view, press Shift-Z to fit it to the window, I can kind of see how everything's laid out. Or I could go to a front view and again Shift-Z and get a sense of everything's laid out. And finally, I can go to a perspective view and again Shift-Z. And in perspective view, I can kind of rotate around and Maybe I can back out a little bit and get some sense of how these things are laid out. Now, eventually what I want to do is animate the camera around. But right now, I'm interested in going and looking at things because I want to modify things. Like I might want to change the relationship of the text to the video or the mask or something like that. Uh, in previous version of Motion, Motion 3, in this camera menu up here, there was something called uh, Fit Objects into View. and um, this is not what this is anymore, okay? Um, it is, I'm sorry, it was, called, it was called frame objects. It was called frame objects before. And what it did is what this thing does now. 
fit objects into view. So it's a little confusing because what used to be frame objects is now fit objects into view. And they split it into two for very good reason. So I want to focus first on this command, fit objects into view. What that does is for any item that you choose, for instance, I'll choose this Kelly Slater group here. If I press F, it will just bring me towards that object. Now, I'm not looking through the camera right now in a perspective view, but it didn't change any rotation. It just moved me closer. If I choose the Andy Irons group and press F, it will move me over there. If I press this B Durbage group and press F, it will bring me over there. If I select the camera and press F, it will bring me right to the camera. If I'm in the active camera view and I try this out, for instance, I'll select the Kelly Slater layer and I'll press F, okay? It frames the selected layer or group. In other words, there's a bounding box to that group that I've selected and you can see how it just touches the edge of the canvas. If I pop that open and select, say, one of these text layers and hit F, it'll bring that until its bounding box touches. And that's great, and I use that all the time in Motion 3 in order to quickly navigate somewhere because I wanted to adjust the relationship of different objects or add another object into my scene. It was a quick way to move around. But it didn't change the camera rotation at all, right? It just moved the camera there, but it didn't rotate it. The good thing about this command is it works on multiple objects. So if I deselect everything and hit F, it will come back and frame all of those objects. So the key thing, why this is still useful, because in a minute you might say, I'm never going back to this command again after you see the next one. The power of this command, and again, it's the fit objects into view. Notice objects with an S. It allows you to fit multiple things into the view. And one of the things that's best about it is just deselect everything and hit F. So you might be um, in some top view, and you might be close. I'll hit F again, and you want to see everything. Just deselect, hit F and you'll be able to see everything, including the camera, in your view. So nice way to move around, but it doesn't change the camera angle at all. Now I'm going to go back to the active camera view. I'm just going to use a keyboard shortcut, Control A. I'm going to double click on one of these 3D view tools, which brings my camera back to 000. Not a new feature, but a nice way to quickly get your camera back to uh, the center of our virtual world here. Now, before when I select Kelly Slater and I hit F, it did that. But what I'm going to do now, with a Kelly Slater group still selected, is go to this guy, frame object, okay, or command F. I see that? Okay, it rotated the camera to face the front of the group. It's a group that's selected. If I select B Durbage and hit command F, it brings it front and center. So it rotates the camera and then brings it front and center. The bounding box might actually be bigger, but it, it brings it front and center. Sometimes you can use a combination, hit Command F and then hit F afterwards to, to move it back. And I frequently use these together. If you select something inside a group, like I'll open this group and select just the, his first name, Bede, hit Command F, it turns to face that layer directly on. So I can go there and say, well, I actually wanted to adjust this relationship to these other layers or I wanted to rotate it a little bit. I can go into work like that and then I can select the Durbage and hit Command F and it comes straight up, I can work on it. I can select the video, Command F, and it's straight at me. So maybe I'll go into the video and select the mask underneath the video and shift it to adjust the video and the mask. So very easy with this Command F to immediately face something. I've been doing that with the active camera, but it works in any view. So if I were to go to the top view, um, I'll hit again, I'll hit F just to get everything nice and close. So this makes it so... I, when you're in 3D space, it's so easy to get lost. It's so easy to start spinning objects around, spinning groups around, and you don't even know where anything is. But these two things, F and Command F, are like your best friends because they make it easy to either fly yourself somewhere, right to a layer or group, or fly the camera there. So here I'm in top view. If I select the Andy Irons group, oh, by the way, before I do this, this is a little bit of change. Um, these tools I call the iPod tools. It's Pan, Orbit, and Dolly. P-O-D, so iPod, and the first one, the pan works like it did before. It, it just pans around the scene, the dolly moves it in and out. The orbit tool used to orbit in all axes, but now if I'm in top view, it will only kind of spin around that top view because people were getting confused when you'd start messing up the view. So you may think, oh, I can't really adjust that top view. But if I select, say, the Andy Irons group and hit Command F, even if I'm in the top view, I face it, and I'll hit F to move forward, and I can frame it. 
So in any view that you're in, or I'll go to a perspective view, and I'll go below and hit F to move everything back, and I can select, say, the Kelly Slater and hit Command F, and it will perfectly frame it. So one thing these are great for is navigating around in 3D space so that you can build your scenes and adjust your scenes. You could also create animation with it. So if I just double click a 3D view tool to get back to uh, my, my first, you know, zero, zero, zero hero, and I want to animate the camera. So let's just go back to top view again for a second. Uh, I'm going to hit control R to reset that top view. And I'll get F so that I'm all straightened out there. So here's my camera, and I want to animate it. I'm, I'm looking right now at Andy Irons and Kelly Slater's over here to the left. So I want to animate the camera over there just so we can see what we're doing. So I'll go back to the active camera view. All I'm going to do is move the playhead forward, say, a little over a second. I'm going to turn on recording. I'm going to select the Kelly Slater group and hit Command F. I'm done. All right, I'll turn off recording. I'll set a play range out point, and I'll play. And I've got, I've got a camera move. Now, if I open the keyframe editor, I can see my keyframes in there. And it's, they're, they're linear right now, so it's kind of a sudden move. I could just select them all. And um, I could choose to make them, for instance, continuous, so I have some smooth starting and stopping. And by the way, one feature request that didn't make it in is uh, in another graphics, motion graphics application, you can hit one keystroke to ease all your keyframes. It'd be nice. It's, it's not there yet, okay? But pretty easy to create a move, a, a camera move like that with this framing behavior. So that's great, but if you were to go ahead and then set another keyframe to try to keep this process along, it would kind of fall apart. I'm not going to do it here, do it here for the sake of time, but if you set another keyframe and then want it to stay still, you're going to need to do a little bit of work on your keyframes. So even though you can use this Command F, just to remind you again, Command F, uh, frame object. You can use it to animate like I just did. There's a better way. All right? Now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to delete these keyframes. I'll close the timing pane, and I'll bring my camera back to where it started. Okay, so now I've got no, no action going on, just the video playing. So, in motion, you should always know if you can keyframe something, whether it's retiming or moving the camera or spinning something, or tracking something, if you can keyframe something, you can probably do it with what? Behaviors. behaviors, yeah. So there's a new behavior in Motion 4, and if I go to the camera menu here, sorry, the Add Behavior menu and go down to Camera, um, we've had all of these here except this guy, okay? Framing. Now, before we had this zoom layer thing that, that kind of did it, it, it would move the camera to an object, but it wouldn't turn the camera. That was the problem. It wouldn't turn the camera. So it was kind of neat, but it, if, if your object was rotated, you're out of luck. But if I select the framing behavior, what this guy will do is kind of everything you want. So I'm just going to move the play it forward and hit O to make an out point. And I'll play it back. And it's not doing anything, because if you look in the heads up display, it's telling me, hey, well, where do you want me to go? All right, well, I want you to go to the Kelly Slater group. So I'm going to drag that group into this target. And boom. Okay? It, it basically does that command F that we did, but as a behavior instead of keyframes. And the reason that's useful is these behaviors are, are quite a bit easier to trim, you know, make them longer or shorter to go faster or slower or change when they happen by dragging. Um, there's also a couple of useful things here in the heads-up display. Right now, if you look at this position and tra rotation transition time, they both say 50%. That means if I stop playback and just kind of drag through here, that move is done halfway through the behavior. So you might say, well, why, why did I make this behavior last for one second if the whole thing's done in half a second? It doesn't make any sense. So you might just say, well, I'm going to move these both to 100%. And now that move gets done by the end of the behavior. And that, that's logical to me. Um, but there's something you can do with this that's kind of interesting. I'm just going to go to the top view so we can see what's happening with that move. Okay, there's that camera move with the behavior. You see the camera moving from one to the other. And in fact, right away in the heads up display, let's change the transition to ease both. That's essentially what we did in the keyframes, right, just to ease them. So now we have a nice smooth start and stop, camera moving from one to the next. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change and 
I'm going to change this position. Actually, let's go back to the active camera view so we can see it happen. I'm going to change the rotation transition time to about 50%. See, I don't know if you see the difference there. Let me go back to 100% for both. So when both are 100%, the camera is rotating and moving the position at the same time. If I set the rotation transition time to 50%, the camera rotates first and then moves. So now we see this new scene swing into view, and then the camera pushes in on it. If we look at top view to see what's going on, it makes it really clear, right? Pretty cool, right? Just by changing this one little slider, and you could change the other way around, say, well, I want the uh, position to finish right away, and then for it to rotate, and now it's doing something quite a bit different. And the best way is just to kind of play with this, depending on your, what you've set up. It'll look better or worse one way or the other. Um, but real fun and easy and simple to play with this and find a better uh, move for it. These ease out time and ease out curves, I, I can't make them do anything interesting. So <laughs> you, got, you got me. I, I just I play with them and I, just, I don't see the difference. Um, but um, there you go. One of you guys will figure it out and they'll tell me what it does. Okay, so that's one way to deal with it. Um, one other thing in the heads-up display, there's this thing called um, orientation, and it says orient to current. So take a look at the motion right there, and I'm going to change this to orient to final. And it's a little bit different. What does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I've read the documentation, and, and I still don't know. It basically says, look, if you orient to final, the camera orients itself every frame to the final destination, but it still doesn't answer the question to me of what it means. So I just play with it and see what looks better. But here's what's really cool. I'm going to go to the top view again. I'm going to stop playback. So I've got this path, this camera path, that's determined by the framing behavior and a few adjustments I've made. But I've also got some little um, doohickeys in the screen here, some little interactive guys here. So what these are is this thing lets me bend the path. So it doesn't have to do the travel that we just had. I can bend it, and I can bend it in X, Y, and Z. This little guy here determines what part of the path I'm bending. So right now, it's halfway between because it's, the camera's focal plane is halfway between. It's a little hard to tell, but it's based on where the camera's focal plane is. So I'm going to back this up, um, and then I'm just going to drag it. Maybe I'll drag it by right in here, X and Y, and create a totally different path to the camera. So now if I go back to the active camera view, and by the way, I could do a split view so I could look at both of these at the same time, but this resolution really precludes it from being able to see it. So now it's, it's a little different. It's a little hard to tell what's going on different there. But now I'm going to go to the right view and see if I can do this without screwing it up. Actually, I'm going to go to the front view and I'm going to take this path and I'm going to pull it up in Y as well. So now if I go back to the active camera view and play, the camera flies up and comes down to land on that next spot. It doesn't change at all the final landing. It's just changing the path. But if I had some other particles up here or other things in the floor, which I purposely don't so I can play everything back, um, I can create a completely different kind of path and tailor the path. Something that normally you could just do with keyframes, you can do with a behavior now. Now, it gets even better. Um, let's say that's all great, but I don't like this final framing. I actually do like it, but let's say you wanted to change it. Uh, I'm going to go back to, uh, let's see, let's go to a per perspective view. And then uh, I'll select the camera and hit the, that F key to back up. It's not quite what I want. I'll try Command F to spin it around. And that's exactly the opposite of what I want. So Command F to spin it around. There we go. And I'm going to select a framing behavior. And the framing behavior gives me a little outline here. And if I drag anywhere on the outline, actually I will do a split view because it's really the only way to see this. I'm in perspective view in the top and I'm in the active camera view in the bottom. So that's my final shot, shift Z to fit it to the window. So in this perspective view, if I drag in this white frame, I can change uh, the framing. So I can make it higher or lower, what have you. I kind of like it the way it is, but you can change it anywhere you want. If I drag a corner of that frame, I can move the camera in closer or further away. So I really have a lot of control over the final framing of the shot as well as the path to get to it. Now I like this very much, um, but one thing I can't do with this framing is I can't change the rotation. 
In other words, maybe I want my final shot, I'll go back to the active camera view, to be tilted a little bit, okay? I don't want it to be straight on. Um, I could rotate an element in the group, but what I really like to do is a little trick here that I think is really useful. Is I use a null object as my, as my frame. Okay, so it's, it's now framing the rectangle. So anywhere I move that rectangle will change the framing. So I can move it up and down and left and right and change the framing in my group. But what's powerful about this that you can't do with those on-screen controls we just looked at is that I can rotate this rectangle, okay? So I can say, look, I want my new camera position to be something like that. So I'm using that, that rectangle, and again, it could be any object in your scene as a little null object to change to, to be the source of the framing. So now I'm framing right on that, but at the angle that I want. And it might look a little more obvious on top of you, maybe not. Um, yeah, there you can see the camera now doesn't face it directly on it, comes in and lands at kind of that angle. Okay, now, the, the kind of last little part of this is, and another reason behaviors are so powerful is, I might want to change the setup of my groups. And if I've keyframed the camera to move somewhere, and then I take the objects it's looking at and I move them or rotate them, I've got to start over, right? I've got to keyframe it in a different way, I've got to move those keyframes. But this is the power of the behavior is it's going to frame that group no matter what I do to the group. So I'm going to select the Kelly Slater group. I'll go to a perspective view, and I'll just hit F to back up a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that group, and I'm going to drag it up in the air, and I'm going to rotate it back on its back like that. And you might be like, well, where am I now? I've, I've totally lost my sense of space. So let's deselect everything and hit F just to back up. And there's our ground plane, and you can see I've kind of dragged it up in the air there. Maybe I'll drag it up a little higher. Right now I can't go straight up because the heads-up display is adjusted around local axis, but I'll set that to the world axis so that I can drag this group straight up with respect to my world. And now you can see that it's nice and high in the sky. Now check this out. I'll select the camera, and the camera is still going to go frame that in exactly the same way. So let's go to the active camera view and look at that. All right, so now I have a completely different path of travel where well, the camera is flying up in the air because I've rotated the group around and it's coming down to face on it afterwards. So between a null object and then rotating the group around, you can create some really interesting camera moves. I'm just going to add one little thing onto this um, because when it lands, it's a little bit boring. So this is nothing new, but I'm, I'm going to point out a little bug that I found today when I was messing with this. Um, it lands, but I'd like to kind of move when I land on it. Anybody done enough with motion that you'd know what behavior you could use to have the camera move around something? Sweep, a sweep behavior, yeah. So what I'm going to do is with the camera selected, choose add behavior, camera, sweep. And I'll trim, I'll have it start, doesn't really matter too much. I'll have it start about there, maybe end around there. And this is actually a bug right now. If we looked at as it comes into land, see how it's rotating in kind of a weird way? Yeah, it should be rotating around, if we look in the heads-up display, the camera's y-axis, and it's not. If I switch to tilt x, it will tilt around the camera's x-axis, so it tilts down. But this, this swivel y is not working quite right. So there's a little bit, of, little bit of funkiness in there, so it's not doing quite what I want it to do. But I can move the camera and then have it move on that item. Now what I'd probably do if I really want this action to happen is you use my little null layer that I created to uh, back up my camera framing in order to have enough room to allow this to rotate a little bit. And I'll have all those pieces come together. Okay? So, um, there's a lot of other stuff in motion. Just I'll, I'll leave you with two things here. Um, so, I have a new book out in Motion 4 that goes over everything with motion. It doesn't go deep into 3D, I'm going to tell you right now. This is, this is for somebody's introduction to motion. It touches on all the features, it touches on 3D, but it doesn't go deep into 3D. Uh, but it does touch on the things that we've talked about in here. Um, also, uh, I have two training videos out. So my, my quick plug is I have trainings out on, on Motion 3 and Motion 3 Deep Dive. I do have a new training coming out in a few weeks on what's new in Motion 4. It does not make any of these obsolete, so it's basically an adjunct. So it doesn't cover, it assumes you know Motion 3, it only talks about what's new in Motion 4. 
So it basically is this plus new stuff. Um, Ripple training, where are you? This is Ripple training. So Ripple training, I work with Ripple training. So if you go to rippletraining.com, you can see my stuff there. I also have a site called applemotion.net, which is my blog for all things motion. So if you want to know about motion, there's tons of free stuff on here, uh, as well as plugs for my other stuff. And finally, I'll just mention Pro Video Coalition. I write for Pro Video Coalition. It's not motion specific, but it's post-production specific or production and post specific. So if you don't know it, you should check it out. And uh, good on time? All right. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>